Well, welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Joining me this week is James Park. James, it's great to have you here. Uh, James is a pastor of Engage Ministries at Wilmot Centre Church, and he's with E3 Partners. You probably think, I've seen him before. Well, that's because we followed James and Brody and a whole bunch of guys around Ontario doing a two-week mission trip. Right, James? It was so much fun. It was so much fun. Well, I'm so glad that you're here this week. Thank you for being with us. I mean, you're a pastor, you're an evangelist, but you're a dad as well. Tell me about your family. Yeah, so I've been married for 15 years to awesome. my best friend, my soulmate, Allie, yeah. and uh, we have four kids. Wow. Uh, our oldest is Eden. We have Lydia. Ezra and Junia. Wow. So it's a busy house, you know, and yeah. we also have this highly energetic dog named Zoe. Oh, I love it. What kind of dog? She's a Vishla. A Vishla? What's yeah. That? So it's like a pointer dog, but they're super energetic. They need to go for runs. I can't just walk her. Like, no. I have to run with her. So. Sounds like high maintenance to High me. maintenance. And yeah, so there's a lot of energy in our home. It's yeah. never boring. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So your oldest is in high school mm -hmm. and your youngest is like two, right? Yeah. Man, you guys like took your time. You know, I had three kids in three years. So, you know, wow. I was a little, that was a little crazy. But anyway, we won't <laughs> go there. Um, how, how did you come to follow Jesus, James? What's your, what's your story? Yeah, so it's... It's uh, really a story of a journey that I was on of discovering my identity, really, you know? Like, I was born in Toronto. My parents are Korean. Yeah. And um, I had an identity crisis at a very early age because I was at a school where most of the kids there were... Uh, like white Canadians, you know, I was the one of the few uh, visible ethnic minorities. And so I was teased as a kid growing up and just because of how I looked and, you know, how I smelled and things like that because of the Korean food. Right, right? yeah, the, which but, we all love, by the way. Oh, right now, kimchi is a, a thing, right? Right, right. But uh, yeah, you know, I got teased a lot. And I remember thinking, you know, why was I born not normal? Mm. And I remember having thoughts like this at a very, very young age. Yeah. And so... I felt that way when I was at school, and I, but I also felt that way when I came home because my parents are Korean, like right. Korean Korean. And so I didn't quite fit in at school. I didn't quite fit in at home. I was a part of two cultures and trying to figure out my own identity. And so from an early age, I, I was trying to find where I belong, mm. you know, and who I was. And so this, I, was, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. Mm. And so I tried really hard to fit in and... And eventually, when I got to high school, I found my sense of belonging with a group of kids that like to, you know, skip classes and drink and... Do the smoke. party scene. Yeah, right? they yeah. were party, partying. Yeah. And then, you know, we would smoke marijuana. And when I discovered marijuana, it's like I discovered my purpose in life. Wow. And so I, I, I would get high and I was like, this is, this is the way. Mm. This is the truth. This is the life. Wow. And, and I realized that when I was high, I felt normal. Mm. When I was sober, I felt sad and lonely and in despair. And so I chased that con constantly. And that it started really a road to addictions. Mm. Now, I somehow made it to university. So I moved to Kitchener-Waterloo. Yep. I started school. Um, but it was there that my addictions went to a whole nother level. Mm. And I started getting into harder drugs. And um, yeah, my life just started to spin out of control where I was getting into violent altercations with d drug dealers, you know, and I got into thousands of dollars of debt into de to, to dealers and things like this. And so I remember I got to this point where I was asking myself, is this who I am? Mm. Like, is this who I'm meant to be, you know? Yeah. And... I began to search like my for my identity, the place of my belonging and all that. And little did I know that my mom was praying for me mm. uh, for many years for my salvation, that I would come to know Jesus Christ. And Those you know, praying moms are dangerous. I'm telling you, I am so You're thankful. looking at one right now, I'm Amen. telling you. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Well, your mom's praying and you are caught in a bad scene. Absolutely. Wow. And this is how God answered my mom's prayers. One day I was in my apartment in Kitchener and God spoke to me and it was like an inner audible voice. It was just this deep within my soul. The Lord spoke into my heart and he said, pray. It was just that one word, pray. And I remember thinking that wasn't my own thought. I think that was God. And I dropped down on my knees right there. 
And I was like, and then I realized I've never prayed before. So I was like, I don't know what to say. And all of a sudden in that moment, I felt the Lord just coming upon my, my life. And I, I felt the Holy Spirit coming upon me. Wow. And that moment changed my life. Mm. And you just started following the Lord from that time on? or It was a journey. I didn't give my life to Jesus right away. Yep. But ultimately what happened, you know, this is again a long story, but basically I was at a coffee shop one day. Yep. I was still battling addictions, right? But one day this homeless man walks up to me and he's like, God sent me to tell you that you're running away from God and he wants you to come back. Wow. And I was like, what? How did he know? Wow. And he led me to Jesus Christ. He shared the gospel with me. And in that moment, I knew I needed to give my life to Jesus. I love it. A homeless man leads you to Jesus. Yeah. Well, that's why you're doing such significant ministry on the streets. We're going to talk more. We're going to get to know you more, James, as we hang out together this week. But what a story. If you're praying for your son, your daughter right now, you keep praying because they could have a story like James. That was so great. Well, now some powerful words about loss. Watch this. To my five children in heaven, Many years have passed since I lost you, but sometimes it feels like only yesterday. As I sit here, I can remember the excitement of each pregnancy, thinking of the hope that might be and the child that might be, and then the depth of loss when there was no heartbeat on the screen, and the pain that came with losing each one of you and having to say goodbye to the hope and the promise that was there. In those early years when I had lost three of you, one after another, I was devastated. I felt alone and ashamed. God was against me because he let other women have babies so easily. I felt abandoned by him and I felt guilt wondering if I had done something wrong to lose you and fear that I would never have a child of my own. <laughs> baby shower after baby shower, I smiled, all the while feeling like I was dying inside. Since no one had seen you, the loss was not real to them. But to me, you were and are still so very real. You are my children, and even though we never met, I have named each one of you. During those painful years, God gave me a scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Good job. Oh, it was so good. Sometimes my anger was directed at him, and I would shake my fist at him, and I would yell at him because he had taken what I loved so much. But he spoke gently to me and he promised me hope no matter what I was going through. Eventually, I had your two brothers, during which time I also lost two more of you. It was a season of joy mixed with sadness. My pregnancies were high risk and filled with tests, ultrasounds, and hormone injections. I longed to have a normal pregnancy like so many others. But when those two boys were born, it was pure joy. I cannot adequately express how much joy your brothers have brought to me and your dad. When they were young, I loved just holding them and looking at them in their eyes and touching them and smelling them. I had longed for a baby for so long. And then as they got older, to watch them jump and play, to cheer for them on the sidelines, to watch one of them get married, 
It was a miracle that I never thought would happen to me. They are amazing men, and I thank God every day for his faithfulness. Having two children on earth eases the pain of losing you, but it does not remove it. I was able to find out the last one of you I lost was a girl. I named you Abigail Rose. I wonder what you would look like. What would our family be like? Would you be tall like your brothers? Would we be friends? Would you roll your eyes at me? Would you have long hair? <laughs> what hopes and dreams would you have for your future? What do you think? I think you look perfect. You just have to say that because you're my mom. No, I think so. Sometimes the pain hits me out of the blue. Like the other day at the checkout line of the store, I saw a mother with her daughter. It looked like they had been shopping for school clothes and they were laughing and smiling and had little jokes that I knew that were just between them. Just like all those years ago, I smiled. But when I left the store, I went to my car and cried for my Abigail. And I cried for all of you. Once again in my sadness, God was there with me in the car. I could feel his presence, comforting me, collecting my tears, promising me hope. Sometimes I feel selfish. I know you are in paradise. I know God cares for you better than I ever could. You never experienced pain. You were never sick. You never cried or had your heart broken. But still I miss what could have been and wish you were all here with our family on the earth. <laughs> you guys are the monkeys in the middle. Someday I will see you. I will meet you, my beautiful children, for the first time. There will be no more tears. God promises me that when he says in Revelation 21, 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And one thing I have learned is he is faithful to his promises. <laughs> Until then, I love you, Mom. Well, that was a very touching story. A mom who wrote a letter to her babies, those miscarried babies. And you know, whether you have experienced a miscarriage yourself or you know of people close to you that have, we've all experienced loss, don't we? We all go through grief and sometimes it's hard to sort out how you feel in these grieving times. I believe we live in a culture that's more about stoicism. It's more like, you know, suck it up and just stuff it down and maybe don't talk about it. And this is not a healthy response to grief. And that's why I think that that piece we just saw really reminds us of how important it is to talk about our grief. You know, the scripture, the writers of scriptures talk very openly about grieving and about loss. And you look, owing to the Psalms, the Psalms of David, he expresses so well the times when he is brokenhearted and when he is lost and when he's grieving. One of our partners at 700 Club Canada is Shirley Thiessen, and Shirley has written a book 
called The Little Black Funeral Dress, Five Things I Wish I'd Known About Grief. You might remember her interview about losing her son. This book is such a wonderful gift and we've been sending it through a partnership with Shirley across Canada and giving it to people that have experienced significant grief in their life. She gives us five steps in her book called The Lap. How do you help someone who's grieving? Here's Shirley's advice to us. Lap, L-A-P-P. -P. L stands for listen. Just listen, let them tell you their story. A is acknowledge, acknowledge their grief. Don't tell them to forget about it or to push it down, just acknowledge it. P, pray with them or for them. And the, la the last P, be present. Lap, listen, acknowledge, pray and be present. I love that advice. And I hope that helps you today as you either help someone else who's grieving or maybe it helped yourself, go to 700club.ca slash corner bend and you can help partner with us in sending these books to more people across Canada. Give us a call. Up next, you'll see how Derek overcame heartbreak and addiction. Watch this. My dad was, was drinking and into drugs and just cheating on my mom and doing things and being a little abusive from time to time and, and my mom just decided not to put up with it anymore. When Derek was seven years old, his mother left his father. My dad not being there, there was a, a void there, there was something missing. As early as middle school, Derek turned to drugs and gang life, where he found acceptance. I would say I was around 13 years old when I first smoked weed, and um, that was the, kind of the marking, the, the milestone that I look back in my life to where I can see where it started. I found like a, a false peace in smoking weed to where it was just like, I felt like I was happy, you know, because it took like all my problems away from me. Everything was just a million miles away. Although his mother moved the family several times to help her son, he always found more drugs and more gang activity. He dropped out of high school his senior year. And by this time, I'm like, my mind is set on the streets. Like, I, I want to be a hustler. I just want to, I just want to, you know, make money and do all these things. As I reflect back, I'm like, well, we always had nothing. We're always on food stamps. We're always living, you know, below average. And, and so I, I vowed to myself, well, I'm never going to be that like that. When I get older or old enough, I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make something for myself, however I can do it. When he was 20, Derek moved from Texas to Iowa to sell marijuana at an inflated rate and make his big money. It consumed my life, it really did, and, and that's what my life revolved around. Um, the marijuana was just, it was like my everything. It was my God, basically. Derek had constant run-ins with the law. One led to a year and a half in prison for drug possession. Nothing seemed to change his course until an ex-girlfriend contacted him with some shocking news. We broke up, I moved out, and then maybe like a week, a couple weeks, two weeks to a month, she had called me and said she was pregnant. From the circumstance of me and my father, I was like, I vowed no matter what, if I ever had a child, I was gonna be there for him. Derek cleaned up his drug habits for a short time to support the mother and child. Just a glimpse of hope, I was like, man, this is, this is, um, this is gonna change my life. Like, I'm a father now, I'm responsible for someone, so like, I really need to step up and do the right thing. The couple began to fight constantly. During one argument, she told Derek the truth about the boy. We just said a bunch of mean things, and she's like, well, you know what, it, it's not your child. I knew it wasn't, and that's what you get. And I was, honestly, that, that, that kind of just broke my heart at the same time, just made me just furious. Paternity tests proved that Derek was not the father. It just kind of like just ripped a hole in my heart, and I just felt, you know, worthless. I felt just like I didn't, I didn't value my life anymore. Derek plunged into his old lifestyle deeper than ever before. Six months later, he was busted by police for his biggest load of narcotics yet. At his court case, the jury found him guilty of all drug charges. Derek received a 15-year sentence. I hung my head in tears, and I was just like reflecting at all the things I've done, everything, and all the stuff I was involved with, and it was all coming to a head. And I'd been in prison before, and this time was more serious, with more charges, more time. And I was like, if I continue down this path, it's going to be the federal penitentiary for multiple amounts of my life or dead. I'm going to be dead in these streets. I was just broken, like I, had, I was done. When he went to prison this time, Derek carried a Bible around with him everywhere he went. It was like a good luck charm more. It was like I just kept it with me. And everywhere I went, any, any little place they moved me, I just kept the New Testament with me. Never read it, just kept it like some kind of lucky charm, you know? So, like, I always knew about God, and I was like, man, you know, if I'm not living this life, then I should try to, you know, try to live a life, you know, with God, in a relationship with God. But I didn't know what it looked like. Derek soon learned of a Christian discipleship program called Prison Fellowship, 
and applied. I was just, um, I was really experiencing God in a prison cell. Like I was really just, just um, feeling like he answered my prayer. And, and it wasn't more so just what people were preaching and teaching to me. It was more so that I was in there, in the Bible, and seeking out truth and finding truth for myself and really saying, hey, I believe this. You know, I, like chains were literally falling off me. Like I was feeling free. I was like, wow. Derek made the decision to forgive both his father and his ex-girlfriend. All of Derek's drug charges were eventually overturned, and he was released from prison after two and a half years. He never returned to the streets or to drugs. My family really saw, they really saw that I wasn't that same person anymore, that, that God had really tran completely transformed my whole life, that I didn't think the same, didn't talk the same, like I almost looked like a completely different person. <laughs> and like I said, for me, it wasn't jailhouse religion. It was, it was real. It was a real relationship. I mean, God has really changed my heart, changed my life. He's faithful. And he's faithful, and he lifted me out of the darkness, lifted me out of the trenches, and just he's real, and I know he can do it for anybody else out there who feels like they're in a place of just, you know, they're, they're just lost. You know, if you just cry out, you just call out, you know, on the name of Christ, and I'm telling you, he will, he will change your life. He did it for me, and he, he, he'll do it for anybody. I wrote out my will in the car because I had no rational expectation of survival. I just started to drive home and I stayed in prayer and I didn't let it overtake me. I wouldn't say I had a lack of peace, but I was in quite significant distress. I poured my heart out in a post and pray specifically that his lungs would heal, that he would start to breathe on his own by the power of the Holy Spirit. I received a call from the nurse and she said, Mrs. Burke, I need to let you know that your husband twisted through his restraints and he's pulled the ventilator out. Hi, I'm standing here in the unfinished area of our church building. We went through a building project several years ago and this area remains unfinished. And some people might be ashamed of that. Oh, you know, it's not finished, it's not complete. You know, the words of Jesus, before you step out and build, make sure you can finish the whole project. But the reality is this bit, the unfinished area doesn't cause us shame because it's all part of a plan. And we have been building piece by piece and finishing piece by piece. And eventually we'll get to this place. And so when you look at the big picture, it, there's no shame in the fact that this is unfinished. That's kind of what Paul was saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 when he said, so don't be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord or me as prisoner. Interesting, Paul's writing to Timothy in the first century. Timothy's a pastor and a leader, and he's struggling with shame of the gospel allowing the shame to tame him, to keep him quiet. And Paul says, don't let that. In fact, he says, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel. Join with me in suffering for the gospel. Embrace the suffering that comes with the gospel. But Paul, why would you embrace uh, the, the suffering of the gospel, that which causes me shame? A little bit further on, Paul says, this is why I'm suffering as I am. He said, I'm, an, I'm a herald, I'm a, a teacher, I, I'm an apostle. Uh, God's called me to go out and tell people about Jesus and then start churches and then build them up in their faith. And, and Paul is actually in prison when he's writing this. He's in prison because he's been faithful. He's embraced the suffering that comes with the gospel. And he says, uh, that's why I'm suffering because I've been faithful to this gospel. I haven't let shame stop me yet. This is no cause for shame. Being in prison and suffering is not causing me shame. Well, why is that, Paul? Because I know who I'm believed. I know that I put my faith in Jesus. In the great poker game of life, I've taken all my chips and I've put them in and they're all on Jesus. And I'm counting on him and his plan that he will fulfill it and he will complete it. And I'm convinced that Jesus is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. I'm convinced that I've taken my life and put it all on Jesus and I've served him and I've suffered for the gospel, but I believe that the plan of God is greater than what I can see or anybody sees right now. That this plan of God that started before the beginning of time is what he just said. 
and will go until the end of time in which God will get rid of death and he'll bring life and immortality to light through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that God is going to do that. And so in the next chapter, Paul says, those that suffer with him will reign with him. Paul really believes that. And that's why he embraces the suffering that comes with the gospel because it's worth it. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? What possibly could we gain on earth that's greater than walking and obeying Jesus and embracing the call and the mission that he's given us to share Jesus and lead people to faith. And so Paul says, I, I, I'm trusting Jesus and I'm convinced he's gonna pull off what he said and it'll be worth having followed and suffered, even suffering for him. What about you? What about your walk as a Christian? Are you letting the shame of the gospel hold you quiet? Or are you freed by faith to speak out in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. What a great show, eh, James? I really appreciate hearing your story. Like, wow, that is incredible. You know, what's the biggest change that God's done in your life since you've, since that homeless man led you to Jesus? Well, for one, he set me free from addictions. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that I now have a knowing of my identity in Christ, yeah. that I am accepted by God, that I don't work for approval, I work out of it because of what Jesus has done. That's it, man, that is it. If we could high five, we will. We'll just do the COVID high five, okay? But that's so good. It's true because we're all looking for that place to belong, right? Man, what a great truth. We look forward to hanging out with James Moore. He's got stories to tell and we're gonna be just enjoying hanging out together this week. But I wanna just encourage you, if you have not yet Yet partnered with us at 700 Club Canada. Would you give us a call? The number's on the screen. We have this wonderful thank you gift for you. The name of God about identity, about belonging. There's great stories in here. So give us a call today and join us as a partner today. We'd so appreciate it. James, we love that we get to pray with people. So Amen. we've got, they call our prayer lines 24 seven and Laura Lee called and said, please pray for my son's salvation. And Fiona asked for prayer for her family and healing over disagreements and misunderstandings. Well, let's, let's pray for those things really quick, yeah. okay? Well, Father, bring Laura Lee to you and I pray for salvation for her son. Go get him, Jesus. And Lord, we pray for Fiona and whatever experiences that they're going through as a family. Lord, we pray for reconciliation and restoration in that family, that there would be understanding, that there wouldn't be any uh, thing tearing them apart, but bringing them back together in Jesus' name. Amen. That's great. Thanks for being with us, James. Really enjoyed it. And thanks for joining us today. Take care. To contact us, visit 700club.ca.